Hello, so in this video we're going to be looking at religion and social change. I'm using the sociology book 2, the blue book on the left side, and what I'm going to try and do is summarise different bits of this topic. Now at the start of this topic we see that we have a follow-on from topic one which was our theories of religion so really that's just a summary of how things are still traditional in religion and like different beliefs of functionalists it's there to conserve and preserve uh, the religion and also keep it traditional as well as looking at you've got your Marxist and your feminist explanations there. But here we're looking at Weber, religion as a force for change. Now, Weber argued that the belief system of Calvinism helped to bring about capitalism in Northern Europe in the 16th and 17th century. Now, this was unique in the sense that it was profit for its own sake. And when people were accumulating this profit, it was similar to Calvinist beliefs. So within Calvinism, there's this belief of asceticism, and that's the idea that we refrain from luxury. We don't spend our money on unnecessary things. We live a very plain and basic lifestyle. And Weber came to say that this was the spirit of capitalism. So people were investing money back in because they were following the religious belief system of Calvinism. They had these beliefs and unknowingly these people were bringing about capitalism because they were just reinvesting into their business, which meant there was more profit. And therefore, we've got this idea of the spirit of capitalism. So we now have the Calvinist beliefs. There are four of these. So we have predestination, divine transcendence, asceticism, and the idea of a vocation or calling. So predestination, this is the idea that God has already decided who will be saved. You can't do anything in this life to change that. It's just already decided, but we won't know until we die what is going to happen. So these people that have been saved are called the elect and regardless of what you do in your life, it cannot be changed. We now have divine transcendence. So this is the idea that God is at the very top and rules over everybody. He is greater and than anybody else and nobody knows if they'll be saved. And what this does is leave us with this unprecedented inner loneliness or the people that believed in these Calvinist beliefs. They had this salvation panic. Now, the only way you can work out what might happen to you is through what's revealed in the sacred text, which is the Bible. See what if there's anything in there of what's going to give us an idea of what might happen later on. OK, and then we have asceticism, which is whereby Calvinists lived a very plain lifestyle and they do so and they wear basic clothing. And it's this idea of refraining from luxury. So not spending on unnecessary things, consuming things, you are reinvesting in your business, which is what they did. And you have this idea of vocation or calling. So prior to Calvinism, there was this idea of otherworldly asceticism and you had a calling from God in a monastery. Now with Calvinism, we're thinking about what can we do on this world now, here and now. So this is why it's this worldly asceticism. People were wanting to bring about change. So remember, this is all about religion and social change, wanting to bring about change, but how could they do it? Now in the Bible, he says to glorify God's name by your work. So they took that and interpreted it as work being a religious duty. So this is why they worked and worked and they became wealthy. And that was sort of a psychological distraction from that salvation panic that they had. And it was sort of seen as a sign that God is helping them. God is relieving them, relaxing them from the stress of the uncertainty of what will happen to them. And so they were accumulating lots of wealth and the business was growing and they were reinvesting all of what they earned into the business. There was a mass amount of profit. And this is what Weber calls the spirit of modern capitalism. But what Weber is clear about is that Calvinism did not cause capitalism entirely. So he argues that capitalism was one of the causes, but we also need material and economic factors because those helped to bring it about too. And we'll look at these in our evaluation points.
Okay, so I think what we've got to take away from that previous slide is the idea that Calvinism, which is a belief system, helped to bring about capitalism. So that's how it leads on to social change. It was bringing about a change in society, utilising religion to bring about that change. But do remember that Weber argued it was just one of the causes. It's not the sole reason. There were other cultural and economic factors, which we will have a look at. And now we've just got another example here as to why Calvinism was successful. So this sort of supports Calvinism, why it was successful in bringing about capitalism. Because we're going to look here at China and India, even though they are more economically advanced, there is no modern capitalism at all. So with China, this is Confucianism. The way I remember this is that they both begin with a C. This is this worldly and it has to be this worldly because Calvinism, which also begins with a C, is this worldly and it's not ascetic. So they don't live a plain lifestyle. They will spend things and consume. OK, and the reason why that didn't work was because if you look at the bottom where Calvinism is, that is this worldly and ascetic. Well, Confucianism is this worldly. That's great because that's the same Calvinism, but it's not aesthetic. So therefore it hasn't brought about capitalism. And then when we look at India, which is Hinduism, so it has to be the other one. This is otherworldly and aesthetic. Well, it doesn't meet Calvinism's beliefs because that's Calvinism is this worldly, whereas Hinduism is otherworldly, even though they're both aesthetic. Both Confucianism and Hinduism lack one of the beliefs of Calvinism. Um, so this is why it couldn't take off in China and India. OK, so we're now going to look at some evaluation. So these are different points to support uh, Weber, but also to go against Weber. And the things that you are going to want to be bringing into the essay if you have talked about the spirit of capitalism in terms of Weber of what we've been looking at. So first of all, we've got this debate with Marx's ghost. So Marx would argue that economic or material factors can bring about capitalism. You don't need both of those things. But Weber would also argue that cultural factors are needed. And that's that belief in Calvinism. Kortsky argues that Weber puts far too much emphasis on cultural factors, so the belief system of Calvinism, and he's underestimating economic factors. And Kortsky argues that capitalism was first and then Calvinism followed. So it's not the other way around. It's not Calvinism, then capitalism. Kortsky says different. He's saying it's that capitalism was first and then Calvinism came about. And Tawney says that technological changes brought capitalism into society. And Tawney's arguing that capitalism came first and then the bourgeoisie took on Calvinist beliefs. OK, so following on from the previous slide, we had just have a few more evaluation points. So in Scotland, Calvinist beliefs were there. They had them, but capitalism was very slow to develop. So we've got to think, why was that? And when we look at Scotland, they didn't have the skilled labourers. So this supports the idea that Weber was saying that we need both material and economic factors for capitalism to come about. In terms of Marx, remember, he was just saying that you only need material or economic factors. You don't need both. And also among the first capitalists were people who had been excluded from the law. So what they were doing was turn to business and kind of unknowingly brought about capitalism. And it was just that their only choice was to go into business because there was nothing else available for them. So we also have another example of religion and social change, and this is in the sense of social protest. So we're looking at the sociologist Bruce, and he was interested in the relationship between both religion and social change. Now, he gives two examples, which are the American civil rights movement, which was successful and was using religion, and also the new Christian right movement, which was unsuccessful, but it also did use religion. In terms of this American civil rights movement, the aim was to outlaw 
racial segregation. And what we find is that it does end in the 1950s and 60s as legislation is brought in. Now, previously, schools were segregated so that black people had to sit at the back. They were seen as not as superior and they just weren't given the privileges that white people were given. And now in 1955, Rosa Parks in Alabama decided to sit at the front of a bus and this spiraled a uh, social change because it gained support, this movement, because many people believed that both black people and white people should have equal rights. And so the black clergy ended up being a backbone for this civil rights movement. And the church gave a meeting place against white violence. So all the black people could meet in a church and get support from one another. They had unity in this face of oppression and the black people could also shame white people for going against their Christian values of equality. So in the Bible, it says to love thy neighbour. And if you are then not giving people equal opportunities, you're not fulfilling what your religion says that you should do. So the message stayed consistent and it ended up gaining national support because the black people could just shame every, all these white people that were Christians, but not following the values of equality. So more on the civil rights movement, we have religious organisations can support protests by taking the moral high ground. So here I remember this a bit from the Bible of love thy neighbour as you would want to be loved yourself. So in terms of this, you have to think of it in terms of the black clergy pointing out the hypocrisy of the white clergy who were preaching that, but also supporting racial segregation. So the white clergy were all for treating everybody equal, treat them how you would want to be treated yourself but then they've supported racial segregation which makes no sense because they're not following their values and accepting everybody so the black clergy pointed out that hypocrisy to the white clergy so taking the moral high ground in the sense of telling them look this is what you preach but then you're not actually doing it okay channeling dissent now for this we think of the funeral for martin luther king and we've got that religion provides channels to express political dissent. So that funeral was a rallying point for the civil rights cause. It brought so much atten attention. If you think of channeling something, channeling something out to all people. So lots and lots of people heard about it and it gained a lot of sort of support from people because people agreed. Everybody agrees with it in religion that you should all be treated equally. Acting as honest broker is your next point and what we think of here is that the church can stand above mere politics because it's seen as separate to the politics itself and also it can provide a place and a context for negotiating change because it's normally respected by both sides in disagreement and conflict. So. The last one is mobilising public opinion. So what happened was the black churches in the South successfully campaigned for support across the whole of America. So we wanted to get everybody supporting this. And now why was it successful? It was because they shared the same values as those in society and those in power. And they could shame those who were in power because in America, they are told all men and women are born equal. Now, we know to this day that not everything is equal still, but this was a groundbreaker in bringing about change and how religion was helping to bring about this change. So the second example that Bruce gives is the new Christian right movement. Now, this particular group of people wanted to take America back to God. And what we mean by this is get rid of all the freedoms that we currently have. So they didn't like the idea that we were becoming a more liberal society and continue to do so. And they wanted to get rid of things like gay rights and the marriage of gay people. They wanted to make it illegal. They also wanted to make divorce illegal and artificial contraception, abortion. And they wanted this idea of creationism to be taught in schools. And that's the idea that the Bible is the literal truth. 
and what they were doing was using technology to recruit members they wanted to try and make it more widespread but it, they didn't because even when you have two different groups with different belief systems trying to come together and cooperate on one thing such as abortion there's still a problem because they have different beliefs and it lacks that widespread support like there was that in the civil rights movement which there isn't in this case because it's just people won't, won't accept it because there's more freedoms it, that we're in a democratic society they are in america and to then take that away and rule by one leader and not have freedom to say who you want in power it sort of takes away all the liberties that people have been working towards for many years so this is why it didn't get that support and it, there was strong opposition with groups who stood for the freedom of choice so our final section in the textbook looks at Marxism, religion and change. Now, when we think of Marxist ideas, we're thinking of a ruling class ideology that benefits solely the ruling class and then instills inequalities in society for the majority. But what we think of here is religion as a dual character. So it can either be used as a conservative ideology so stability, keeping things as they are, or religion can have relative autonomy, which means we can become independent of that economic base. We're not stuck in the structures of society. We can bring about change in society also. And Marx sees it as a way of bringing comfort to people, even if it is illusory. It can help humanise people despite them being exploited in society. And this idea of a dual character, Engels argues that as well, and he argues that religion can be used to bring about social change as it can challenge the social norms. So we can see that liber we have liberation from slavery and misery. So we're challenging that with religious ideas, with religion, we're using that to stop slavery. And lower ranks have often supported popular protests through the church, so holding slavery protests. So we have this idea that religion in a Marxist sense, it can be there to keep people in their place, but it can also be used by people in the working class to speak up and be heard in society. We also have Ernest Bloch, and this is the principle of hope. So religion it has this dual character, the idea that it can keep things as they are, or it can inspire hope into people. And Ernest Bloch, he accepts that religion often inhibits change, so stops change from happening, but he does emphasise that it can also inspire protest and rebellion. So he sees religion as this expression of the principle of hope and that that is our dreams of a better life and contain images of utopia. And this is the idea that people are being deceived to think they will be rewarded in heaven. And that can bring about change because if people think, oh, well, we can bring about have rewards in heaven. Well, we don't have to wait till then because we could create a vision of a better world here and now. We don't have to wait. So therefore, religion can bring about this view of a better world. And these images may help people see what needs to be changed here in this world. We also have liberation theology. So this is a movement in the Catholic Church in Latin America in the 1960s. And it's the idea that there's this commitment to the poor and an opposition against this military dictatorship that was currently in society. So what we see is poverty and a huge growth in slums and there's lots of human rights abuse. But these people aren't doing anything about it. And this is what led to this liberation theology idea to so think of liberation as in giving people freedom and the Catholic priests wanted to help the poor out because they felt like it was their duty to do so as a priest. So they established support groups and these are called base communities so that the church itself could help to fight this oppression. So what they did was develop literacy programs for the poor and they were educating them to understand their position and situation in society. But because the priests were taking the side of the oppressed, uh, some people 
uh, strong leaders, Pope John Paul II, hated that because it was bringing about Marxism and the system. It was resembling Marxism. It was telling people who are in a working class situation that they're being exploited. Look, we can give you the skills. You can make a difference and become higher up in society. Now, people who are in a position of authority are not necessarily going to be wanting to do that because they want to keep the masses in their place. So what we find with liberation theology is that the movement has lost influence, but Casanova argues it's helped to bring about democracy, that independence to put forward who it is that you want in power. Maduro sees religion as bringing about change. Priests felt it was their Christian duty, as I was saying, to help the poor out. Lowy questions Marx, arguing that religion does not always bring about inequality. And all of this, of what we've been saying, depends on how social change is defined, because different individuals define it in different ways. And although liberation theology helped to bring about democracy, it did not challenge capitalism because remember, Pope John Paul II condemned it because it was going to reveal capitalism to those people who were in the slums and that didn't happen. So it doesn't reveal capitalism or challenge it. Following along from the previous slide we have now got the Pentecostal challenge and this is David Limon. So we're thinking of this in terms of option for the poor and option of the poor. Now the option for the poor is thinking about liberation theology. So what happens here is priests will go out to the poor and they'll raise awareness of their situation and they'll help them improve and they'll be the ones that support the poor. Whereas Pentecostalism, this option of the poor, is where people try to change their position and that was supported by church pastors. This is conservative, you have to get yourself out of poverty. It's all about using your initiative and helping yourself to what's available, self-improvement. Another part in the textbook is millenarian movements. Now, by millenarian, we mean 1000. And this is the idea that God would rule for a thousand years and then the day of judgment would happen, followed by the end of the world. And when that day of judgment happens, it's whereby it's decided who will be saved and who will not be saved. And this appeals to the poor and it tends to arise in colonial situations. So we'll have a look at Walsley's cargo cult study and what this is interested in is bringing about change in this world and bringing the kingdom of God on earth. And Walsley says when the day of judgment happens, it will be the group that will be saved and not just the individual. So this does appeal to the poor and not to just individuals because it will be the group that will be saved and the poor people tend to be clustered in groups. So I'll now just have a look at Worsley's cargo cult study. So this is this millenarian movement in Melanesia. So this is the Western Pacific. So places like Papua New Guinea, the Solomon Islands and Fiji and a few others. And what was happening here was cargo. So material goods, imagine like crates, almost arriving on the island for the natives. So when we say that we mean people in the Western Pacific, but instead they were div diverted by the whites for themselves. So like British people who had got a colony over in the Western Pacific. All this cargo, which was meant for the people that lived on the island, was then directed towards the white British people. And this then threatened colonial rule and led to widespread unrest because, understandably, the natives were unhappy that the cargo, the material goods that were meant for themselves, were being taken away by these leaders. And the movement combined traditional belief with Christianity because Christ's imminent second coming to earth, the day of judgment and the punishment of the wicked was a reminder to these leaders that had gone into the colony, uh, the British people, that, well, they can be punished and they're not going to be saved if they're doing wrong. And Engels, remember Engels, the Marxist sociologist, argues this movement represents the awakening of the proletariat self-consciousness. They've realised that the goods that are meant for themselves are being taken away by white people for themselves, these leaders that have come into their area, and 
their awakening to the fact that that's unfair. So there's this idea of a self-consciousness. Furthermore, we also have Gramsci, religion and hegemony. So when we think about this part, we want to be thinking about how do the ruling class maintain their control over society? So we've got this term hegemony, and this just means leadership of society. And when that is established and ingrained into society, the people in those positions can rely on consent to their rule. So they put forward the laws and the rules in society, and they just ensure that everybody else follows them. They rely on other people doing it. But what we've got to think about is this hegemony is never guaranteed. It's never guaranteed that the ruling class will have leadership over society all the time. And we can challenge that. So Gramsci, like Engels, sees religion as having a dual character. It can challenge as well as support the ruling class. So some clergy may act as organic intellectuals, so that's as educators and leaders, and help support the working class and also organisations that support the working class, such as trade unions. And finally, we have Billing's study, which is whereby he is comparing two communities. These are coal miners and textile workers. And in this sense, we're looking at religion and class conflict. So both the coal miners and textile workers were working class and evangelical Protestant, but the miners were much more militant and had better working conditions, while the textile workers accepted the status quo. OK, and now we're looking now in terms of leadership, organisation and support. So the miners had the organic intellectuals. Remember, that's like the priests that are giving up their time to help improve conditions. So they help the miners to the union calls, whereas textile workers lacked that leadership. They didn't have it. The organisation now in terms of the miners, they had the churches to hold meetings, but textiles workers didn't and they lacked the space to do any sort of church meeting. Support. Churches had prayer meetings and groups singing for the miners, but textile workers had opposition from local church leaders. So here we can see that religion can play a prominent oppositional role. And his study is showing that the same religion can be called upon either to defend the status quo, so the textile workers defending the status quo, or justify the struggle to change it in the sense of the miners. So in summary, the key bits that I suggest you take away from this is Weber, religion as a force for change, the spirit of capitalism, the idea that we have this Protestant ethic, in the 16th and 17th century and I just want to point out that Calvinism wasn't put forward by Weber, somebody else. It was John Calvin that put forward Calvinism but Weber builds on it and says that it's what brought about capitalism. He just interprets what happened with that belief system but the belief system is put forward by John Calvin. We also have the American Civil Rights Movement and the New Christian Right Movement. Remember, American Civil Rights Movement was successful and the New Christian Right Movement was unsuccessful. We have your Marxist theory with liberation theology. Remember, Ernest Bloch for Marxist, the principle of hope. Liberation theology, remember, Pope John Paul II condemned it because he thought it resembled Marxism. You have your millenarian movements, your cargo cult study, Gramsci and hegemony, and you've got your billing study that you can always talk about. I also cannot stress enough how important it is that you practice the short questions and longer exam questions in the textbook. Honestly, they are so useful. Um, I just go on the website and see as well. You've got the answers on the website for the short questions. The short questions are useful. They trigger your memory and the longer questions, you're going to have these long exam questions in your actual exam. So the more practice you get, the more able you will be in that exam. OK, and I just want to say thank you for watching the video and best of luck with all your practice and revision.